Just want to welcome everybody. Welcome to Pride Table Talks. This is a collaborative project of Pride Northwest, Zami Noble of Portland, Sage Portland, and Glappen. Our goal, as you've kind of probably already picked up a little bit in our conversation so far, our goal with these monthly conversations is to preserve and share the stories and the experiences of older lesbians in our community. Um, this month, we're excited to welcome Naomi Little Bear Morena, who is a, let's see what I have on my list, songwriter, musician, author, lead guitarist, I love that, <laughs> and community organizer, which is sort of woven into all of that. Um, welcome, Naomi. I'm really excited to, uh, to have this conversation and, and uh, honored to be able to get to know you better. Thank you so much, Naomi. I feel honored to to be able to be here to share my story. Right on. Um, well, let's kind of start from the beginning, so to speak. Okay. Um, let's, uh, where did you grow up and kind of what did your path to Oregon look like? My, my past? Path to Oregon, like how did you get path here? Path to Oregon, right, right, right. Well, I grew up in, um, in a barrio in San Fernando, California in the 1950s. And uh, it was a, a extremely dysfunctional uh, family situation, the dysfunction created actually by racism. So there was a lot of, um, I saw a lot of family members uh, uh, addicted to drugs, die from overdoses or uh, remain uh, incarcerated for the rest of their lives. And, and uh, so it was a place where where I, um, you know, as a young girl, I felt invisible. I, and because uh, um, of different circumstances within my family that found me there. And, and uh, I ended up um, uh, moving uh, my, my mother, uh, who had previously left me to live with my grandparents. Uh, uh, decided to take me back uh, to live with her and my stepfather and my half sister and uh, one of my sisters. And it was in Orange County, California, which was a huge, huge cultural shock for me. I won't say it was a cultural difference. It was just a cultural shock. I'd never been around that many um, uh, white kids for one. Yeah. Uh, going to school, you know, the teachers in our, in our school in San Fernando were primarily white and some of them were extremely racist. We weren't allowed to speak Spanish in school. We'd get punished for that. And, and by punished, I mean hit. Mm -hmm. So it was, there was uh, that. And so to go from that to an environment that was, that I, I felt like I stood out like a, like a sore thumb and, um, and as a process of all that fear of being in an environment that was totally alien to me, I, um, I worked to lose my accent. I, and I just dove into music. I dove into guitar. I'd always loved guitar ever since I was a little girl. There was musicians in my family, people who would play like a guitar and 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 be dancing in our yard at night on Friday nights and it was just those memories really stayed with me you know hearing that and that's what I wanted to do I wanted to play guitar so I just put all my energy all my grief uh, because during that period of time my grandparents who raised me they both died within six months and um, and that that's their lives and what they suffered through really stuck with me and have stayed with me throughout my entire life because they they really suffered a lot kids will often say that poverty they don't notice poverty really I mean you know I remember being hungry but you, you don't notice it it's just a matter of fact but the but I knew that that they noticed it and I knew that it hurt them and uh, so uh, it's just that kind of pain of knowing uh, that their lives uh, ended in poverty. And um, so uh, then I happened to watch television and I, and I saw Bucky St. Marie singing, My Country, Tis of Thy People, You're Dying. 
And it just blew my mind in so many ways because I saw someone that looked like me as a child, you know, long hair, you know, I had long braids when I was a girl and, uh, and, and she sang and played guitar and her heart and I could feel her, her, her heart and what she was saying and, and, and it just, and it was crushing, but it was very inspiring all at the same time. And it's not that I decided to pattern my life after her so much as that it, it stuck with me. She, her songs and her music really, really stuck with me. And they still, you know, I still follow her music. But um, yeah, I started uh, 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 babysitting so I could earn my first guitar. And I uh, taught myself how to play electric guitar, but it would be a whole year before I got an amplifier because my mom wanted to make sure I was serious. And mm -hmm. so it was just a long path. And then uh, I happened to, um, you know, once I graduated from high school, I was the first one to graduate from my high school in my family. So it was, uh, it was momentous, but given the traumas that were all around me, you know, no one re really was there for my graduation. So, uh, you know, it's just uh, all these missed opportunities, you know, yeah. for, for interactions, you know, in my life. But uh, I, I just stuck with music and, um, I met a couple of, uh, uh, I, I, I moved to Oregon with a bunch of hippies that were coming to live in Bridal Vale. And uh, after we were there for one whole, uh, you know, we, were, we arrived sort of late spring and then by winter I had gone to visit my family. And when I came back, everyone was gone. They all go back to California because it was starting to snow. <laughs> and nobody had heat for the firewood. So I hitchhiked back to, to LA and uh, eventually I, um, I was homeless for a while and then I settled in, uh, in Santa Ana and that's where I met um, uh, uh, the women that had started a women's center in Santa Ana and that's where I got turned on to feminism and uh, starting a feminist uh, musical group with uh, Robin Sa Flowers. At the, her name was different at that time. And we started uh, uh, probably the first, uh, you know, uh, feminist oriented um, uh, duo back then called Sisterhood. And we ended up backing uh, Maxine Feldman on the first uh, mm -hmm. 45 by a lesbian singer. So. These were like, you know, a lot of hardship, but it was always like finding, being there to ride some kind of wave right. that was kind of new. You know, we went to one of the first women's music festivals in Tucson, and it was just, it just took off from there. The, and, and then my music became adapted to, to the different issues that I was hearing around and the different women around me, they influenced me. Had you, um, had you come out at that time or when, where oh, was that along? Everybody <laughs> well, well um, the coming out process is a, is, a, is a very long, but an important story. For, uh, for women of my generation, I think, and maybe I won't cover that here, obviously, uh, the time constrictions, but uh, I had never heard about, uh, you know, like many uh, young dykes my age, at that age, uh, at that time, we probably thought, we thought we were boys and we felt we were boys and no one was gonna tell us any different, you know? And, and that's sort of how I, uh, my grandparents didn't impose strict, uh, you got to act like a girl, you got to be this way. It, they were pretty hands off. And, and that was very fortunate for me. But I was aware in grade school that there was something um, that didn't quite fit in with the other kids. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, you know, I was pretty athletic back then. And it wasn't until I was um, playing baseball that one of the uh, kids uh, yell, yelled out and said, oh, she's a queer. And I had never heard that word, but it really disturbed me because it sounded really menacing. 
to to an extent. It sounded like a, a like a Mark Cain or something like that. And and I hadn't I, I I was too afraid to look it up. But it wasn't until high school, after so many unrequited crushes on my you know high school girlfriends and and uh, and all the that I and then reading books you know uh, about. Uh, psychology books to try to find out well what is homo homosexuality and that word was so frightening to me just the word was frightening homosexual and then looking it up in the dictionary and then and then uh and then the uh, the word lesbian was even more threatening because oh my god that sounded so foreign it sounded like you're from a foreign country like from another planet right. and it didn't feel none of that felt good none of it felt felt good uh, so that actually when I was, uh, so I didn't, I, so I was having these crushes and I kept, was keep being rejected because I was crushing on straight friends, uh, my straight girlfriends. But then um, I thought, well, I need to, I need to find out where, where the lesbians are. <laughs> and, and I remember I moved to Hollywood because I, Hollywood was a place where I knew a lot of strange people were uh, counterculture people. You know, you'd read about it. You know, and 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 uh, and sure enough, you know, you look at the free press, the L.A. free press, and you look at their ads, and that's where I find ads about. Uh, it just seemed to me that my options were so limited. I remember calling an MCC pastor and I wasn't religious, you know, I was into Eastern philosophies at that age, you know, at, you know, 18, 19. And I didn't really want to go to church. I, I had to undo all that Catholic, you know, upbringing and the guilt and the shame and the humiliation that comes with that. So that wasn't my scene. And then the bar, I wasn't, a, you know, I was a hippie, so I wasn't into bars, so I, that wasn't my scene either. I wasn't a, a drinker, you know, and um, so it became a real crisis for me to figure out where I was going to find um, uh, other lesbians. And then I remember, uh, then, then when I found them, uh, the first time I actually saw what I thought were lesbians, mind you, growing up, I'd see, you know, we'd see Liberace on TV, you know, yeah. my mom liked Liberace, but she, she'd see Johnny Mathis and she'd say, oh, I feel so sorry for him. Oh, the poor man, because he had mascara on, you know, was, she was so, she thought that somehow that that's what I thought about myself, mm -hmm. that there was something to be pitied, that I was a freak of nature and, and, you know, it really was so painful to see that, her reaction to, to Johnny Massa, Mathis, and I just carried that in me as well. So I, re, I was, um, uh, <laughs> there's a character in, a, in, a, in a, that TV show with Delta Burke and the Southern Girls. Uh, oh, Designing Women? Designing Women. Remember the, the character, the African-American man who would always talk about his being, uh, uh, I can't remember the term, but he was falsely imprisoned, right, for something, right? Or, right. And, and, well, that happened to me when I was 19. I was, uh, I was arrested under, uh, because I did have my identification with me. I made an illegal left turn mm -hmm. and uh, I ended up in a, in, a, in a county jail and then a city jail and then maximum security before knowing. For a wrong turn. Yeah before knowing what, what I was even in, in right. jail for. But when I was in, the, in, in this one uh, cage car, they had me in a cage, handcuffed in a cage, and all the other prisoners weren't handcuffed, you know. But I was, so I was pretty special. And I saw uh, two women come on board, and one of them was 100% was, uh, Butch Dyke, real cream, and and that scared me because I remember combing my hair like that in the mirror as a teenager. And then beside her was this very femmy woman. And I thought, wow, these are my people. And I have to choose between one or the other. And, I, and it just seemed too overwhelming for my young age to figure out that I had to participate in a certain type of uh, 
role that uh, at that time didn't, you know, obviously I wasn't femme. There was no way I was going to be femme, but I just didn't know where I was going to end up. So I was in the closet. I was in the closet and my all my mom knew was that I had a lot of uh, roommates. And, um, and it wasn't until one of those roommates uh, of mine got pregnant, which was uh, 16 years ago, that um, I had to kind of say, well, hey, mom, you know, my, my partner's having a baby and and she knew who my partner was, so, but it was really awkward. Um, I, I just didn't want to face the rejection and the humiliation and, and the shame. And I just knew everyone would just be waiting there to tell me what I was doing wrong. And, and um, I couldn't, I couldn't do that, you know, I, it took, uh, I, I think a lot of people out there are a lot more braver than me. A lot, a lot of people out more braver than me, but I wasn't brave. I wasn't brave in the 70s. You know, as long as I was in my community, I could be brave, but not, not with my family. I didn't come out to my family. And um, I mean, that's, I don't, I can totally understand that. I didn't come out to my family until I was oh. here. Oh wow! Okay, well, I feel better. Yeah. So it's yeah. uh, you know, I I don't know if I don't know if the people who know you would agree that you weren't brave, but well, I know everybody had their struggles, and I've heard a lot of stories from different um, different women talk about the reactions that they've had from their parents, and and you know, uh, there was dealing with with that, and and then just I I. Like a lot of people, I had to go to a big city to find, you know, uh, the lesbians and and uh, and I remember showing up at uh, at the women's health clinic, and um, I was just I I was homeless at the time and I and I needed to see a doctor and and there was this beautiful striking lesbian doctor. And uh, she was so nice. And, and the women that were working with her, you know, they all look like hippies, but they were women, but they didn't look like the kind of hippie women that I knew, <laughs> you know, they were really very assertive and, and, and doing really cool stuff. And, and, um, and she gave me an address and that was an address on uh, 15th and Alder. And that happened to house a lot of uh, uh, lesbians, <laughs> and uh, that that stayed in my mind. I didn't I didn't stay in Oregon. Then I went back to to California, and that's when I met the Santa Ana Dykes. Um, but I did come back, and uh, you know, um, so yeah, that was that coming out process was. Uh, yeah, what a process. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, well, I, first of all, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think a lot of folks, a lot of what you talked about definitely resonates with me. It's, um, I used to wonder if I had actually done it wrong because <laughs> I had friends who had much worse experiences and this and that. And really, my experience was just not being able to express myself more than anything else you know that hiding piece right well yeah people got kicked out of their homes and yeah and beaten and you know you know I did I just quietly snuck out you know and right. well no and and nobody was going to notice anyway you know because uh that wasn't my life experience was to have somebody you know really guiding me through life mm -hmm. so it was like okay I got to do this on my own and uh, and uh, but it's 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 been a learning experience you know to and and and, and I think that it, it has had to be getting older that has made me be able to um, really pull my 
my own pieces together, my own story together, and my own, uh, because I feel like when we're younger, we're very susceptible to our friends and our peers and, and everyone around us. And we get into a space of, uh, of discovery, in a sense, because it's our first independence away from whether you've been to college and you've been you know, studiously, assiduously studying, or whether you've had parents that have just been pushing you all the way out and, you know, and that you still have communication with, you know, it's just, um, it's, uh, I, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, coming back to in my case, I, I can never feel I can speak for other people. I just want to speak about my experience. And, and uh, because when I, as a musician, I know that I got a lot of input from folks, uh, well-meaning at times, suggesting what kind of songs I should write, what kind of music I should play, why am I playing with this group of people, and why am I not playing with this other group of people? as if it, that's something that you can really control because you know you have to be very assertive to make that stuff happen. And I wasn't a very assertive person, but I just happened to meet certain people who kind of modeled that kind of you know, ways of doing outreach and, and speaking to people. And, you know, Kristen, you know, was a, a really excellent person who would be our, the front person of Izquierda to be able to communicate with the powers that be. Right. Because all I wanted to do was play and sing. And I was moved by the, the issues of the day. I was moved by, you know, back then uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation was being shot at by federal agents and folks were dying there. And uh, there was a boycott uh, for the United Farm Workers. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved in all those things because they, they, they meant a lot to me. Um, but uh, yeah, at, at the same time, you, you do lose yourself. In, in this process of trying to uh, represent uh, maybe uh, a perspective or that other people aren't familiar with. And this is the lesson that I've learned at this age is that I might have been able to convey certain messages through my music, but one thing you can't convey is the actual experience. Yeah. And, and the actual experience of racism, uh, systemic racism, and abuse, and neglect, and um, poverty. Those things you can't really say, oh yeah, you know, this is, you, you totally get it, you know. People don't get it. People don't get it. Uh, I, I know we mentioned this, is that I don't think that there's a lot of real there isn't a visceral understanding of what segregation did to people, mm -hmm. segregation did to people of color. Right. So we are really just the walking wounded, but we're trying our very best to get back to our communities because we remember how our communities suffered. And that's why the, the, the election of somebody like, uh, what's his name, was absolutely devastating to so many of us, as, and, and it was devastating to me, uh, especially when what he did with the children, because I know that those children are gonna suffer, suffer long-term psychological effects, right. long-term. And that was caused by one man and his gang of white supremacists. And this is happening has happened in our country, in this country, just when we thought we had gotten civil rights. But, you know, I guess we should have known better because right after 
the civil rights movement, so many of those great leaders like Dr. King were assassinated. Mm -hmm. So the, the messengers keep getting assassinated. We become the canaries in the coal mine. And I think we're really at a very, very, very scary place because it's gotten, it's gotten, they've gotten so bold. You know, the, the, the white supremacist movement has gotten emboldened by, by lies and, and the lies that are still being regurgitated at this time are anti-immigrant, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, if anything, that's, that's going to be, that's just going to be a, a battle that's going to continue, I think. Well, yeah, I think um, probably the greatest I don't know, mistake, I don't know if it's the right word, the, but the thing that we do is, and it's very similar in, in you know, LGBTQ plus rights, it's with, with all of this is, is thinking that we've finished. Right. You know, and that we've gotten there, and that it's you know, and that everything's cool, and it that's not how, that's mm -hmm. not how it's ever worked in human yeah. history. It and it, and it's never going to end when when LGBTQ plus get their rights. That's right. it's not going to end there. <laughs> you know, we can get all the rights in the world, but if if people are 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 being oppressed, and especially you know, people of color, you know, it's just. We're the, we're the easy targets, you know? And I mean, look at what's happening to Asian people. You know, people disregard our humanity. You know, they see that we're not part of the, the white blend and, 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 our dis, and our humanity is just thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't have an idea of a, a good perspective of, of history and, and uh, you know, and our stories, that's why, you know, this is so important to, to be able to, I, I you know, I, I want to share a perspective that I fear will get buried by whatever the, the new flavor in the block, whatever's new, you know, in terms of a, of a, of a political or, or, or academic uh, conclusion to my existence. And, and I don't want that to happen. You know, I, I uh, we've, we forged a path when there was no internet. We forged a path to find each other when we didn't know that where we were. And then, and then our numbers seemed, there was this, uh, I think there's just this thing that happens is that a, the scarcity, this feeling like, well, you know, if I have this partner and if that partner is not the best person for me, I just have to stay there because there's right. a scarcity of us, right. and um, and now at, at at our age, you know what uh, older dykes like myself are experiences being alone, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and you know my family is most of my family has passed. I have about uh, uh, four family members that I kind of keep in touch with not all of them super comfortable with my being gay but I, I know I feel the love I, I know that the love is there but it's so distant and they're all in California mm -hmm. and um, so this has had to this has been my home and and all my energy has been devoted to trying to bring people together you know, and um, and I just feel like that we're not together, you know, and I and and that was uh, we're not as together as I'd like, and that was uh, I think I think when you're when you're trailblazing a path that you know somewhere else but but that and but you're not sure other people are are blazing that same path because you don't see them you just imagine that they might be out there doing the same thing and you you end up living in a fantasy world sometimes because you're imagining what that world could look like what that perfect world where you have that partner and and you know 
I had uh, desires of being married in my 20s when, when, oh, no, you can't get married. That's the patriarchy. That's not, that's monogamy. We can't do that. And, and now everybody has wives and husbands and it's just like, whoa, your head spins, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it just keeps changing and changing, but the realities of individuals don't change if they've experienced a certain a certain existence that doesn't change right um well i think that's i'd like to talk about because you you mentioned this in our previous conversation and and all of what you're talking about is is really what i've seen come through in the work that you've done mm -hmm. expressing all of this in in your songwriting in your other writing um, and so I want to kind of go through some of those experiences so that, sure. you know, to, yeah. you know to, to put them out there because it's a lot, first of yeah, all. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, so let's start. You founded what we believe is the first lesbian choir in Oregon. Right. Okay. Right. The Ursa Minor Choir mm -hmm. that now grew out of a... Um, at an event that I had uh, mentioned to you, uh, the Bicentennial of America. And I was really bad at history. So it was just like, I, was it 1775 or 1776? I don't know. I don't care. It was awful. But anyway, I wrote a song called uh, Why Did You Come to America? And uh, I taught it to members of Family Circus, who we were uh, touring with at that time. Hi, Deb. She's probably not out there. But anyway. Um, when I uh, started working, doing music with Kristen, uh, I, I wrote the song and I wrote a song, a an accompanying song called Poverty. And, uh, and we recorded it, but it was mysteriously lost. So it was never shown on television. But out of that came the choir and, um, you know, and some of those women I still know, uh, you know, Sparky and, uh, uh, gosh, now I'm losing, Mary Rose, I think she was in, in the choir at some point. But it was, uh, it was, it was, then when Iskir the got together, we would go across the country and I would teach, uh, we would ask the producers to get together a pickup choir uh, and women would come to our rehearsals and I teach them how to sing Like a Mountain and, uh, and uh, Sisters Take Care of Sisters and they would join us. And, and in some of those cities that we played at, then they started lesbian choirs. And uh, that was 1976. And... Uh, and around that same time was also when uh, I started uh, the Dyke Tones because we were, uh, Char Priolo, uh, who was in the Dyke Tones at that time, uh, she was also in the choir actually. And we were singing some of these doo-wop songs and we said, hey, we should do some of this. And we both contacted different people and then we started the Dyke Tones. So uh, I, I, I feel like, um, that's just been, I didn't realize how much of this I did over my life. I just did it. It was just an impulse to want to teach other people to be part of this. And I think it's partly because I grew up in an extended family with my cousins and we all played together and, 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 and that um, I, I'm, I'm more like a wolf really than a little bear because I like to have a pack of people to sing and do creative stuff because I found that for me, music was my language. Music was the way I could, I could talk about things that, that, that hurt me or, or felt difficult. And, and, I, and in the 70s, just like now, there was a lot of conflict in, within the women's community and I wanted to bring some kind of um, peace because I didn't like, I don't like conflict. And, um, and I know that's simplistic, but at the same time, 
in the end, we still, we change, you know? So all these things that we may have been fighting tooth and nail for back then, you know, you kind of let it go once you start to get older and then you find your own, your own backbone, your own strength, your own peace, or your own bile and, and, and research that and figure out, well, where was that coming from? You know, what's going on in there? All this stuff, you know, we're always having to learn about what we eat, what, how we're nurtured, how we're not nurtured. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, somebody's knocking at my door, I apologize. That's um, okay. And you've got a Q&A open there. Yeah, you, well, it's, um, Tate has asked a question. What principles and values were important to young lesbians when you were first finding your community? Um, and what if young lesbians of today, well, this could go on a long time, what I know. If young lesbians of today forgotten? Well, the young lesbians of my time, uh, it's, it was a very different bunch of folks, I think, in, because like I say, there was no internet, there was no, uh, there was no LGBT anything, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. It was a wasteland, so we had to really just find each other. So when we found each other, I th the group that I found in in Santa Ana, it was all about feminism. So we were all we got caught up into uh, not caught up. I don't mean that in a negative way, but that was an issue for us was women's rights. Yay, yay, women's rights! But uh, and so we brought a lot of support to feminism and then the same thing happened in Portland. We brought a lot of support. Women I know cre created clinics and battered women's shelter. We did we a lot of ourselves. That's what our, I felt our young women's community did is give a lot. They became teachers, they became counselors, nurses, doctors, psychiatrists. They, and with that, they were able to heal or give healing to our community or give to our community. So I, I would say that the hallmark uh, value of the community of, of, of lesbians when I was growing up was one of uh, being extremely codependent. And that's the worst part of it. The best part of it is that all these wonderful things got created. But the other thing is that we neglected ourselves. I really believe that we neglected ourselves and uh, neglected our worth. And that goes back to that shame mm -hmm. and the humiliation and the uh, internalized homophobia and not and, and, and all those psychology books that told us we were demented or, right. or not normal. Um, younger uh, lesbians, uh, I think, uh, are having a hard time now. Uh, I, in the sense that there's just, it's just such a wide open, uh, uh, I think that in some cases, uh, some lesbian, young lesbians might be getting harassed for not being gender fluid, for not being bisexual in a, in a sense, or not being pansexual. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that across the board, but but I'm just going to say that in my generation, we had uh, women coming out of marriages that were bad marriages, and they got married because there was no other, they could see no other path. Women who had become nuns, you know, once again, you go to where the women are, you join the Navy. Our generation was always looking for women. We were always looking for others who felt like us. And then we had these horrible, uh, uh, this horrible literature to, that we had early on, like the Well of Loneliness, or all we, or or the Fox, the movie The Fox, you know, where we're always sacrificing ourselves for our lovers who fall in love with a guy who takes them away from whatever perverted lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know that, and and it just becomes that we, it just <clears throat> we got to do that, and I want that narrative to change, you know. So I, I, I think that um, there is so much out there in high schools and grade schools, uh, 
of an awareness of LGBTQ+, but uh, I don't know how much context there is other than in terms of, of, of an understanding of where, where you come from. And every person, you know, uh, has, will have to find that affinity group that most strikingly resembles your path and resembles the kind of support that you needed. Right. Growing up and coming out. Um, speaking of, of finding, finding the group that most feels like where you should be. Or, right. Um, and you and I talked definitely a little bit about this. We've had a couple of questions come up that sort of speak to this. Um, was it easier being accepted as, and we're talking specifically of Portland at this point, was right. it easier being accepted as lesbian here than being Latina? Oh, definitely. Okay. I, I, everybody, I think it was a lot easier, I, and I think people did just keep the lesbian goggles on, but it was very hard to put, to put on, trying to put on my life experience, mm -hmm. and, which is the experience of a lot of, a lot of um, uh, Latinas, especially of my generation. Uh, th and this is something I've mentioned to, to various friends, uh, uh, which is that I've been to your houses, I've stayed in your houses, I've eaten at your houses, I've met your parents, but you wouldn't have ever been able to have met, met my, you know, that, well, first in the home that I was raised, there was no room for anyone to, to visit. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's just an area of friendship that I think people just kind of stop because they know that this may be beyond comprehension. This reality, this other reality might be beyond comprehension. I mean, really, and I, 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 and it doesn't have to be comprehended. It just has to be listened to and acknowledged. It doesn't have to be like, oh, yeah, I can relate to that because this happened to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's not what we need. Because I think that's always the go-to is like, uh, oh, well, yeah, you know, as a gay man, you know, I, I can relate to that, you know, it was horrible, but you didn't have, you know, it's a different experience and I honor that experience and, and, uh, as yours, but, um, uh, to look at, uh, at color and, and race, especially to look at the oppression of, of the fifties and sixties, and then this resurgence of garbage. Um, yeah. That actually reminds me of, um, I'm going to read a little something. It's your, um, your writings have been included alongside the likes of Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith, Norma uh, Alicorn. I'm totally butchering that name right now. Particularly in, uh, there's in a, it's an anthology, uh, the Bridge Called My Back, Writing by right. Radical Women of Color. Right. Um, and I know that this is a new book to me that I will definitely be reading um, because it's really influential. Uh, and it's kind of what you're talking about is reminding me of this book because it was written before, it was written before intersectional was a word, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and really laid the, help lay the foundation for, for this sort of intersectional third wave feminism that we have come to see these days. Right. And, and even just that word, I mean, you're, you're, we're throwing out a word that's been, yeah. that's been intellectualized and academicized and, and whatnot sized. But that anthology is our stories. Right. It's, 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 it's the heart. And, and I, ironically, when I was approached by um, Sherry, Maraga, and Gloria, really cool women, and they were from the Bay Area, and uh, 
And I felt like such a greenhorn because I was still just this little barrio girl. And it's hard to define what that is. I think, I think Cherie knew what it meant, but I wish I could have written a lot more. And I have written a lot more since, but um, I've devoted so much time to being a musician and then, and, and then to um, raising my son and, and working, you know, so that I don't end up homeless because that was the number one goal for me is that I, I don't want to end up homeless like my aunts and uncles and I want to at least have shelter over my head. Right, right. Um, you wrote a song and this is when, when your name came up to, to, to invite onto this program. This is the one thing that everybody recognized. Um, you wrote a song, You Can't Kill the Spirit, um, that was, I'm not sure how many people were familiar with the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp in the 80s. Probably um, not, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly we move on from history, even in this day of, of everything being televised. Yeah. Um, did you, and this is a, a question that Kristen asked, um, back in that back when you wrote that song when you were writing these songs did you consider your music to be protest music when you were writing it no <laughs> i didn't really consider myself to be a protest singer mm -hmm. i i i i was familiar with joan baez and judy collins and and of course buffy and uh but what they taught me wasn't to, oh, I should look and see who's oppressed and write a song about it. What they taught me is that in, within my life experience, I can be a musician mm -hmm. because they were brown and indigenous, you know? So I saw them and I thought, I can do that. I can actually go out there. And, and besides, I had something running through me that made me do it regardless. You know, I was uncontrollable. I sang... Tom Dooley in second grade, you know, I just volunteer, I'll sing, I'll sing, you know, and uh, it's just that I've, I've just had that spirit to want to sing all the time, you know, and I think it's because that's a language I feel comfortable with. My first language, of course, was Spanish, and, um, and when you lose a language, just like losing your name is really painful. Mm-hmm. You know, I would have dreams of going back to the barrio and rushing in the door to, to see my grandparents again and then not being able to speak Spanish. And uh, so I want to preserve. So, no, I'm not a protest singer, but I sing what's in my heart and I care about what's going on in the world. And I care about what's going on with, uh, with everybody that is suffering, especially children. And, uh, but then, you know, before that, <laughs> I was a 13 year old girl who was also super impressed by by uh, George Harrison and Keith Richards playing lead guitar. And, and that was another huge part of my identity. I would say that the most enduring parts of my identity is my being a musician. And that's my preferred mode of, of operating and, and writing is part of that, of course, and being a, a mother, which is odd because I'm, you know, I would consider myself a soft butch lesbian. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and I'm proud of that now. I feel like I can be proud of that now, not be ashamed and not be. But you know, it just I was brainwashed and programmed. You know, if I go visit my family, I gotta, you know, dress and drag. And so, the, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's great. Kids of this generation should be allowed to dress however they want. You know, and if little boys want to wear mascara go for it or young men you know it's just so ridiculous that we monitor fashion basically and hairstyles it's just it's absurd 
the spirit inside knows what it what it needs and where it wants. But back to can't kill the spirit. Back, uh, uh, Kristen will remember that, you know, I know that my music was always unusual. In fact, that when I read reviews, you know, when we toured and all that, the, the writers, you know, they say nice stuff, but they have this very unusual music. And yeah, I wasn't, I didn't learn. It just comes through me. And, 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 um, uh, and, uh, and, and it tells a story. But uh, when I'm feeling something really painful, I turn to music. And we had just tried to see if our music would be something that, like, Olivia Records would have been interested in. And they didn't think we were commercial enough. They were hoping to book a salsa band or record a salsa band. See, right away, putting people into boxes. I hate that, you know, I really do. If you're Hispanic, sing something in Spanish. Well, you know, I, I lost my language when I was 13. I recovered it in my mid thirties, but that loss was horrible. It was through being torn away. You know, I was torn away from my family of origin, which I considered my grandparents and was living in, in with my mom, who was tr trying to pass as white in a white neighborhood. So uh, I'm kind of reminded of, I, I just saw this movie, uh, The uh, Sapphires, The Sapphires, about an Aboriginal group of young women uh, singers. And I, I, I could really identify that how people can take you away and then, I mean, just kind of move you around. And it, I mean, because they were taken away so that they could be bred, so that they, they breed out the ab Aboriginal blood, you know, so they become less Aboriginal with every generation. And I truly fear that with, with my family as well, that we become less Mexican. And uh, yeah, anyway, so I came home from that thing with Olivia and I went straight to the piano and I played Can't Kill the Spirit just all the way through. And had and I was sad. But at the same time, I feel like my ancestors are speaking to me. And I just know this now. It took me a long time to realize this. That my ancestors are speaking to me and they're telling me not to give up hope. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me, here, here's this message. And um, in terms of the music, that I'm writing now, for example, um, there's a song I wrote when I, the first time I went to Mexico, that was a very, wow, talk about going to your roots. It was very powerful and, and amazing. We were, uh, we went all the way to Oaxaca and we were staying in a home where there was a couple of uh, Cuban women who were, taking advantage of the local young women to do their laundry, their housekeeping, their, and then, and they would be asking people, oh, bring this stuff, always brings, we need a uh, Swiss army knives, we need this and that. But they'd go through all that stuff first and then give the leftovers to the poor folks. So I had gone out, I didn't want to stay at that place, it was a hacienda, so I went out into a field out way into somewhere and this woman was walking by and she had a basket of laundry on her head mm -hmm. and I had on our trip down to Mexico I had already seen devastating poverty I saw a man uh, you know plowing his field with with a with a, a branch of a tree mm -hmm. tied to a cow women washing their clothes on the rocks so this woman, I saw her and I asked her if she needed help and, and she was really sweet, you know. She took me to her hut. It was a it was a hut with a dirt floor and a little fireplace in the corner and a baby in the corner. And then her husband came and we had beans and and, and to eat and tortillas and and she told me the story of these women and how they uh, um what they were doing, they weren't paying the young women who were working there. And 
but just before that I ran into that woman, I had this vision in my head and I wrote a song about it and it was called Million Eyed Woman. And it was about the violence that was being directed about towards women and to the earth, to our mother earth. And, uh, and that to me was a pretty significant message uh, that came to me. And then after, so now, since then, that was more of a peaceful, please, pleading, you know, if you, you wreck her, you, she's not going to come back, you know, if you kill and poison the earth, she's not going to return. But now I'm working on a project where I'm releasing a recording of a song that is uh, kind of the bookend to that, and it's called Song to a Dying Star. But Song to a Dying Star is very heavy rock, bringing back, me back to those roots. And I know that some people might say, oh my God, that doesn't sound like he's scared though. Oh, she's playing rock and roll. It's like, you know, I don't want to put myself in the same place as Dylan, but is that response that Dylan had when he played electric guitar at Newport, you know, oh my God, you know, you're not a purist anymore. But, you know, I've never been a purist in terms of music. I love music and I've played in all sorts of bands, all kinds of music. Um, and so I hope that people can get the, the vibe of Song to a Dying Star as being one of a powerful statement of that we're having these corporations dump crap into the waters and poison and pollute and and uh, it has to stop because there's no planet B. Right. Anyway, I don't know. Um, no, this is. I mean, this is. This is what this is your story. This is what we're hoping for. Yeah. Um, so I have a. So Kristen has written a message. Um, Kristen Knapp, who, uh, uh, first of all, is thanking you for, for Song to a Dying Star, bringing it forward again. Um, but she's, uh, like a mountain, has been so important to so many people in different situations. It's truly a universal, truly universal, in its message of hope for the human spirit. I listened to it earlier today. It was, it's amazing giving sustenance to anyone oppressed or suffering. I feel honored to have been part of sharing it with audiences across the country for four years touring with this gear ensemble 77, 1980. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting how, uh, and this is just me geeking out a little bit of, of like all of the, Oregon's not a big place, but it's not that mm -hmm. small, but there's so many like, this person knows that person. And there's so much connected history that I've learned over the years as I meet more and more people. Um, this, someone asked the question, and, I, and I, I would like to bring this up just because it came up in our conversation and it's something that, that we know has happened throughout music recording history. Um, you know, which of your original songs have been recorded or covered by other artists um, and I know that there's a thing in there where there's a lot of folks singing your song that didn't even know it was your song. Right, um, right. Which also means that you... I never earned a penny. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, well, yeah. Um, yes, it's been recorded by a lot of people and uh, a couple of famous people and one that I was able to... Uh, remodel my bathroom as a result of a settlement but uh, mostly the story I, I've been getting a story about permit for permission to use a song either in a recording or in a book uh, or some other kinds of project there was a quilt project at one point calendar project and uh, I always have told people well just send me a copy so I can keep it in my own personal archives. And I keep, I just get them all the time. All every, I, I got two just last week. And one of them was a young man whose mother, uh, let me say a little bit about Rena because it's really important. 
Uh, fortunately, one of the calls I did get just about a month ago was from somebody in Paris. They're doing a documentary on Greenham Common and they wanted permission to use the song. I'm so glad they got a hold of me because yes, my song has been used without my permission many times, many, 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 many times. And um, in recordings, I don't care. I, I mean, I'm, I'm honored and moved when people use it for, for grief or to give them hope because there is a lot of instances like that that have left, that really move me to tears when I hear the stories. But um, uh, so this French company is going to be doing that. Bibi Kidron, uh, a documentarian, made a, a documentary of Greenham called Carrie Greenham Home. I happened, they, I, I was gifted that copy when I went to Greenham and participated in the uh, Wow, that was, <laughs> I feel so lucky that I got to go to Green and Common. And even, even though I was only there one, a day and a night, I was afraid I didn't want to get arrested because I was there from another country. So I didn't want to get thrown out of the country. Right. But I did a bunch of concerts there. And, and, and it was so amazing because they didn't know the song had a, a, had a singer attached to it. And, um, but, uh, uh, this young man, his mom, his grandmother used to go to all the uh, Greenham Post uh, uh, protests. Thousands and thousands of women. It was an international uh, encampment of women and girls in Greenham Common, England, where at one point they surrounded the entire missile base, 30,000 women holding hands, chanting uh, my song among other songs of, of, of courage and strength. And uh, so this young, his grandmother had been there and they sang Can't Kill the Spirit at her funeral. So he sent me the article, but he, he's a younger fellow and he's a musician and, he, and he's going to be doing a composition of the song. So I think in Europe, there's probably more uh, folks um, that, have, that I don't know about that might have used the song. Mm -hmm. I've heard from as far as South Africa, uh, Nicaragua, uh, and then a lot of places in Europe. And uh, it's, uh, like I say, it's, it's, a, it's a gift from the spirit to, to the spirit of people that are hurting. Um, I, a, a woman that I met in England when I went there the first time, her daughter, um, her baby girl was in a stroller and and uh, this guy just changed lanes and took the stroller and killed her baby girl. And she told me how she couldn't uh, bury her baby until her friend started singing the song. So, I don't know, it's overwhelming sometimes. You know, and uh, I just wanna keep doing music. And, I, and there's been so many things that have been in my way, so many barriers to do music. There have been feminists who didn't want to play my music <laughs> for because of political reasons. And, and I just pray that I can continue to play my music because it is the only, it is the only voice I have to give. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I know that it's, it's, it's from the spirit and it's from, from my ancestors and and it makes me feel it makes me feel whole when you are you are still writing you are still performing you are. uh yeah yeah well <laughs> i i've been trying yeah. there you, you just put a new video out i know i know I, I actually yeah. after um you know like i said i didn't i didn't perform for 20 years when i was raising my son and working cuz i was uh, commuting 2 hours a day to my job and working 10 hours a day at work so uh, i um, yeah once uh, once uh, 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 what's his name was elected i released uh, i contacted a friend of mine who put me in contact with marilyn keller and she had these beautiful connections with Daryl Grant, who did a beautiful arrangement of Can't Kill the Spirit. And, and that was a labor of love. And, and Isetta Smith, who have, uh, has been, geez, stop it. <laughs> she was also a supporter of that project. 
Uh, so I put that video out. And then uh, after the Kavanaugh hearings, I was so angry about what happened to uh, Dr. Christine Blasey. And so I had a song from the rock opera that I'd written called Survivors. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, I released that, and that was with a lot of support from uh, community people. I really wanted it to be an intergenerational event. And, uh, and so I reached out to as many people as I could to be part of that video. So I did that, and then I also released uh, just, uh, just kind of my first pop love song. <laughs> that I ever that I have ever written willingly <laughs> and it's called sick love and that's I uh, my son has helped me put a YouTube station so it's uh it's on there uh and now we're working on on uh, doing dying star and my uh, I gotta mention my 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 trusty cohort musician that has been with me throughout the pandemic Casey Lee you know, we've both just been there trying to hold each other up. Uh, we're both musicians. We're diehard musicians. We played together in the Dyke Tones. Casey played with me on the last cassette recording that I made of Something Comes Along. And we have rehearsed twice a week since the pandemic. Um, and, and we were rehearsing before that. And uh, now we're going to be... Uh, releasing you know we have to lay down some more tracks we have to lay down the vocal tracks but Casey and I have been like the two stalwarts in the band we've seen other members come and go we do have a, a, uh, a young person who's going to join us uh, Henry Hobbs uh, incredible young talented person who's going to join us um, but uh, we I would welcome uh, it was great talking to uh, uh, Max, because uh, she said she was a musician. We're yeah. always looking for other musicians to work with. Casey plays bass and drums. My son is playing drums with us now. He's uh, he's a really good drummer. But I, I would love for us to have a band that we can go uh, and play little gigs. And the, and we're doing cover songs. We're not doing uh, East Carolina songs. We're not doing a lot of protest songs. But we are doing some of my electric stuff. Nice, nice. You, what's your, what, what's your name? Your YouTube channel? Um, it's under Naomi Little Bear Morena, and the name of the group of me and Casey are "We're the Mighty Swans," and it's uh, this is our swan song, and we are, we've worked through, you know, we we both have essential tremors. So it's a huge challenge to uh, create music when you know you can't control tremors in your hand. Mm -hmm. But the actual um, process of continuing to play has really—I mean, it's still a struggle. But we're just—we're just getting better and better. <laughs> we're just—we're really good, I think. You know, we've got really good, but it's a struggle. It, I mean, we're. And, and, and I hope that this is something, I think generally the message for the younger lesbians and, and, and younger queer folk out there is that um, when you look at some of these pioneers, you know, you, I hope you, you realize that our path made it easier for y'all to come out. Mm -hmm. And you're still going to have struggles with families and friends. That's always a given. Or anytime we leave our safe neighborhoods, and that's always a given. But um, I think there's a, a lot of people that work very hard to make this happen, to have something like that we're everywhere, you know. Uh, it's just like that title, This Bridge Called My Back. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, I think the analogy would fit as well, is that uh, there are so many people of our generation, uh, from Stonewall to everywhere, that have made this happen, made us be able to have visibility. And right now, it's, things are 
sort of like this, but you know, we, you're not alone. You know, you're not alone. And, and what a big difference if you're wandering all around the country by yourself, you know, you don't have to do that anymore. You're not yeah. alone. Um, what, this is, this question is always weird because it always makes it sound like you're dying, which isn't true. Um, what are you most proud of in, in the work that you've done? Whatever that work happens to be, um, what are you most, what are you most proud of at this point? Well, just being able to survive, to be alive, to keep writing music and to keep putting the music out there. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm proud of uh, Can't Kill the Spirit uh, Like a Mountain uh, as, as, as um, something that came through me. But um, I'm just glad that I survived to be able to, to get this far because it's, uh, there, you know, it's it's not been an easy road. Um, does do does anybody have any questions yeah. that we haven't? There's so much they could still be because we could talk all day, um, and I'd be totally fine with that. Uh, does does anyone in our audience have any questions that have come up for you that we haven't uh, that we haven't touched on at this point? I feel like we should have interlude music at this point. <laughs> I'll go get my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, first of all, I really, oh, oh it's 420. Oh, Max, we have a message from Max. Oh, we have a couple of folks. See how it starts coming. Thank you for paving the way and making beautiful music along the way. Um, and actually, oh, here's a question. Do you, do you read music? No, no. I, I think I, I have some kind of dyslexia around music and math. Mm -hmm. I've tried to learn how to read music, but um, the way I compose is um, I hear the parts in my head. <laughs> I was telling Casey that this is kind of funny. I, I was hearing a song in my head uh, the other night. It was really, really late. And I was hearing the parts. And, oh, man, this is so cool. I haven't written a song in ages. And this sounds really, really good. But the lyrics that we're coming to was Still Waters Run Deep. And I thought, that sounds so familiar. <laughs> and, then I, and then I Googled, you know, because I, you know, this is the first time it's happened, but it's uh, Aretha Franklin. So I was channeling Aretha Franklin singing Still Waters Run Deep. Uh, it was uh, with um, a Bridge Over Troubled Waters kind of across. Not exactly, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if, if a person really needs to learn how to read music. Um, I mean, it's important if you want to be a session player and if you don't want to frustrate pre people because some people are very drawn to the paper. And um, but I'm too old to to be taught <laughs> that trick. And uh, um, that's why actually when we did these tours, Isetta was was the one that really taught the songs and the harmonies because I'm a little hyperactive and I couldn't really sit, sit still enough to be able to do that. And, and she's, oh, but you know, she would t teach the songs. And no, I, 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 I never, I never learned. I taught myself guitar and piano, uh, chords rather, harmonica. And, um, and I think that I, what I would really have wanted in my life they, uh, my only regret if there is you know it's really ridiculous to have regrets about one's life but the only thing that i miss doing is that um well like song for a dying star i would love to for that to be a rock opera i have i would i would be able to write more songs i already have one song acid rain million eyed woman that that fit with that genre um i I, I, I grew up, I didn't grow up watching musicals. I, I, I thought they were really corny when I finally did see a musical. And I thought, whoa, well, I, 
I saw Sound of Music, but I was on LSD and it was just like, wow, this is so strange. But um, no, I, it, and I was embarrassed to see West Side Story. Um, uh, and because I was so embarrassed of people using Spanish accents and I knew just by looking at the actors, except for Rita Moreno and this one dark guy, they were all white, the, mm -hmm. the sharks. Um, and uh, right, but uh, I, but I like the concept of musicals because you have various characters that tell a story and you have right. protagonists and you have antagonists and you have uh, heartache and love and, and it, it, I don't know. I, uh, so yeah. I, I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to do that, but if anybody ever out there who wants to uh, record a, an animated feature for Song to a Dying Star, I can't pay you. It would be a, a mission. Uh, it would be a, a, a gift to the song. Um, but I have some really cool ideas for animation for the song. I know. I know. <laughs> Just put it out there. Um, um, Margaret. Go ahead. Man, I don't have. I, I, I don't think I can say. <laughs> She starts to sing, and she. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows? Uh, I can, I can sing a, a, ver a verse for her. I, if you, if that works for you, I'm. We're, You're we're not on. alone. There are others who feel for the pain of those oppressed and poor. And those who've been shamed, lift your eyes and your voice and sing loudly for everyone. If everyone won't sing with you, lift your eyes and your voice and sing loudly for everyone. And everyone will sing with you. That's for you, Margaret Ann. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so. Uh, Thanks, Naomi. I, sure. I think that's, that's like the perfect, perfect ending for the, for the conversation, I think. So do we leave together? Do we punch the button together? Uh, we, you can, you can punch the button whenever you like. Okay, well, thank you for those who participated. I, I, um, I hope you check out the music mm -hmm. on, uh, oh, on uh, YouTube. And uh, it's on Bandcamp, too. You can uh, uh, buy it for a dollar, Sick Love. And uh, it all goes towards a worthy cause. <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> thank you, too, Margaret. All right, I'm going to go now. All right. Thank you. You take care. You too.